Well, hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the Hacks and Wonks post-primary roundtable. I'm Crystal Fincher. I'm a political consultant and host of the Hacks and Wonks podcast and radio show. And today I'm thrilled to be joined by three of my favorite Hacks and Wonks local reporters to break down what happened in last week's primary election. We're excited to be able to live stream this roundtable on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Additionally, we are recording this roundtable for broadcast on KODX and KVRU Radio podcast, and it will be available with a full text transcript on officialhacksandwalks.com. Our esteemed panelists for the evening are politics and communities reporter for the Seattle Times, Daniel Beekman, staff reporter for Real Change, covering local news, labor, policing, the environment, criminal legal issues, and politics, Guy Aron, and Seattle Axios reporter, Melissa Santos. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Well, Thanks. I think, Hello. yes, so I think we will get started talking about Seattle and all of these races for Seattle City Council. This is a year where we had some redistricted council districts in Seattle. We had a number of incumbents decide not to seek re-election and a few who did and some really interesting results. So I think we'll start in District 1, which is in the West Seattle area, where we see a result of Marin Costa with the lead uh, currently at 33.16%. And the second person getting through the primary, Rob Saka, with 24% here. So I guess just starting out, how are these candidates positioned? And what do you think this primary says about the state of the district and the state of this race going into the general? Starting with Daniel, what are your thoughts here? Oh, uh yeah, good questions. I'm interested to hear what the other folks have to say. Um, I guess the, you know, one thing that strikes me about the race is that like in, uh, I think every other race of the seven districts, we're going into the general election with a candidate who is endorsed by the Strangers editorial board and one endorsed by the Seattle Times editorial board, um, which operates separately from our newsroom. Uh, and um that's that's pretty typical for for Seattle City Council elections, um, and maybe even without those endorsements, this race and others would have ended up the way they the way they did. But I think that's something to note in this race and others. The other thing I guess that struck me about this race is two pretty interesting candidates, background wise, especially to to some extent in Seattle politics with Costa doesn't really fit the if there's a typical sort of um, uh, Seattle candidate, especially sort of in the left lane, the progressive, more, more progressive lane, I don't know if she fits quite into that. Um, you know, she doesn't come from uh, a sort of, she hasn't worked at the city council. She doesn't come from sort of like, you know, the, the county or state labor council. She um, hasn't been sort of steeped in local uh Democratic uh, legislative district politics or anything like that. I don't think um, she, you know, she's uh, from the tech world and was a, an activist uh, in in that world. So um, I don't know. I found that interesting. I don't know if that's a major takeaway, but the, it's something in that race that I think will be interesting to watch going forward. Uh Go ahead, Melissa. What did you think? I will be curious. It, it's really hard in a race where there's what we have eight candidates here again, or was it actually nine? It was eight in this one as well to kind of predict how the votes that the candidates didn't get will shake out. I'm really curious to see where Phil Tavel's votes go because um, you know he's he ran last time too, and kind of again more sort of one of the more business friendly candidates in this race, and I'm just not sure that there'll be sort of a one for one accounting for those votes necessarily when you come into November. Um, uh, theoretically, those votes would go to the more center lane candidate who is Rob Saka, but I don't know that that math is a direct line it, it, when there's a lot of time between here and November. And also they're just, um, 
sometimes people are really attracted to someone's personal story in these races, right? It's like we're kind of focused as reporters and sort of commentators sometimes on who's the moderate, who's the who's the uh, you know the lefty or whatever. And sometimes um, I don't know that voters always are. Maybe there's one particular idea they had that they talked about at the door that people were into or a, a percentage were into. So, and, and just, there's also progressive candidates here that had some votes that are not making it to the primary. So I just don't know. Um, it's one of my, I have zero idea how um, the votes for the non-winning candidates will shake out. Yeah. What do you think, Guy? Yeah, I think to start with um, all these Seattle races, um, I think the biggest message is that most people didn't vote. Um, 64% of folks didn't vote in these elections. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see um, where those people land in the general. Um, it did seem like a very competitive race, all these city council races, um, but especially the open ones. And so I think Marin was able to really um, use her credentials as an activist to um, get a lot of support among progressives. And um, while the more right of center lane um, was a little more um, split between um, Phil and um, Rob Saka. And so it'll be interesting to see how it measures up. Um, I think right-leaning candidates won just about 50% compared to progressive ones that won about 45%. I was doing some like rough arithmetic earlier. Um, so it is pretty, um, it is pretty like narrow margin. So um, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Yeah, this is a race where it looks like this is going to be a competitive race in the general election. We did see an interesting role that donors played in this race, where there were um, some substantial fundraising numbers from a number of candidates, even, you know, several who didn't make it through. Uh, I, you know, I think there were a few who eclipsed $50,000 who did not make it through the general election. And then you had the two that did make it through raising a considerable amount of money. In addition to an independent expenditure on behalf of Rob Saka that uh, made some news for a Trump supporting uh, donor included in there and, and certainly more business aligned candidate there. Do you, I guess, how do you see the role of, of donors and money and, and the way that the primary election shaped up? And, and what do you think that says about the general election? I guess starting with you, Guy. It'll be interesting to see. Um, I think with democracy vouchers, it really changes the game and allows people who don't rely on corporate donations um, to run. And so I think that gives Costa an edge there um, to fight at least an even battle. Um, it'll be interesting to see if this election is more like 2019, where corporate donations sparked a big backlash, or more like 2021, when they got folks like Davison over the line. I think that the... Uh, independent, ex in, excuse me, the independent expenditures, I think, will sort of be interesting to watch because theoretically the democracy vouchers do e even the playing field. But once you get all that independent expenditure money in there, um, it's not limited in the same way. So I do think we'll see this huge flood of outside money going forward. And I am watching how whether that kind of undermines the intent of the democracy voucher program. I mean, we've had a few years now where we've watched, watched how this plays out, but particularly this year, I, I'm, I'm looking at that because I just think there will be a lot of outside money. Um, and there already has been in this, in this race in particular, I mean, maybe not a lot yet, but more than in other races of city council races. And that can kind of, tip the scales. But like, like I said, there has been backlash before. We certainly saw that with the what, $1 million Amazon donation um, to the uh, Chambers PAC uh, that kind of seemed to have that kind of resurgence of the progressive candidates in protest a few years ago. Yeah, I think it would be right to, yeah, to expect uh, big outside spending in this race and some of the other races that look like they could be very, uh, very competitive um you know that seems very likely <laughs> and um uh one of the sort of quirks of this race in terms of spending in the primary was that there were some candidates you mentioned crystal like stephen brown you know i think you know got under 10 percent spent money but or raised quite a bit of money but a fair chunk of that i think like 
I was just looking, $34,000 or something like that was from himself, uh, I believe. So that kind of tips the scale sometimes or it can be confusing uh, looking at the overall totals. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is one of those races where it, you know, we would be surprised if there, there wasn't a lot of independent spending in the general election. You're saying bagels yeah. can't buy a city council seat, Dan? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> what you're saying? <laughs> I'm just saying that this city, what, what was it? The mailer, uh, the city deserves better bagels. Bagels. Yeah, maybe that wasn't effective. I mean, you know, maybe a different audience. Maybe next Maybe next cycle. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. And, and another race where, you know, sometimes people just have a ton of money and they think, well, I have a ton of money. I can loan myself money, donate to the campaign. But more often than not, we see those predominantly self-funders not necessarily finishing all that well. It actually does take the support of people in the community. And, and those donations are basically a measure of support from people. And that seems to be important in overall results. I do want to talk about District 2 now, which is um, includes the Rainier Valley, Southeast Seattle, and that is where incumbent Tammy Morales is facing um, Tanya Wu, who will be proceeding through to the primary. And this is one of those races where in Seattle we see numbers shift from election night to others. This certainly was no exception, a race that shifted, and as we stand now, Tammy Morales, over 52% of the vote uh, here, 52.26%. Tanya Wu with 42.58. So about a 10-point spread. This is one of the races where people were wondering if there was going to be a backlash to the council that showed up. Lots of talk going in about, oh, the council may not be popular or, or have high approval ratings. I've noted several times, similar to congressional uh, approval numbers, those don't really have much bearing to individual congressional results here to individual city council results. And this is seemingly a, a strong finish for Tammy Morales as an incumbent here. How did you see this race, Guy? Yeah, um, I think initially on election night, um, oftentimes media covers it as it's definitive, especially like not local media, but national media. Um, it did seem close, but the fact that Tammy Morales um, won by 10%, um, got over 50%, that's huge for her. And I think it will be very, very hard for Tanya Wu to unseat her at this point. Um, and it shows that Morales has a lot of support from a lot of the district. Um, and so, um, especially considering the fact that Harold went really hard supporting Wu and um, it looks like that didn't work out too well for him. Do you agree, Daniel? Yeah, I think to an extent, um, you know, definitely the race swung a lot, I think more than any other uh, from election night to, to now. Uh, although other races did also have a, a leftward swing it with the later ballots. Um, I mean, I think it looks like the sort of stand any kind of a chance, uh, Tanya Wu will have to sort of, you know, she's a first time candidate uh, and sort of raise her game, her candidate game, you know, in, in the next couple of months. And also it'll be interesting to see kind of what I was looking for on election night. What, will that race be close enough for the people who fund those independent expenditures to decide that they want to get in. I mean, I don't know, but maybe they weren't necessarily expecting her to move to come out on top, but maybe they were looking at, well, is it close enough to make it worth our while to spend? And, you know, uh, you know, if I was her, I wouldn't want to hear the race described like that, but I think it's just reality is people are looking at in for the outside and they're making sort of decisions about, um, where their money is best would best be spent. So it'll be interesting to see if you know what calculation um, those folks make, whether whether people think it was close enough to be worth um, pouring money in or not. Because remember, this was one of the least crowded races. It was just Tanya Wu, Tammy Morales, and then Margaret Elizabeth, who got less than five percent of the vote. So it's not one of those sort of mystery how did the vote split situations as much. 
this one is more likely to be pre pretty predictive of the pro of the general election. And um, yeah, there's only so much money to spend, even though we talk about tons of money in politics. It's people don't want to just throw it at nothing. And well, it, it, I, I don't think it's a lost cause. I think Tanya Wu has a chance. It doesn't look as good as it did on uh, the night of the election for her. Yeah, absolutely. This, to your point, Melissa, more than the others, I think, one could be viewed through the lens of, is this a referendum on, on Tammy Morales and or the council? And also, this is one where, where it, it does pretty much reflect what the race is going to be in the general election. I don't think we've seen a situation before, barring a massive scandal, where an incumbent has finished with over 52% of the vote and, and lost to your point, you know, those those trying to figure out their number of open seats, there are, are certainly uh, seats that that some people want to pick up. Is it worth spending in those? And this one is going to be part of the calculation that people make. But but this is a harder one. It's it's hard to see incumbents losing in this kind of a position. How do you see the general election shaping up here, Daniel? Uh, well, I think, you know, we kind of know what kind of a race Tammy Morales is likely to run because she's, I think she's run similar races to some extent, the, well, she, when she won her seat and then the, the race before that, when she nearly unseated Bruce Harrell. And then, so I think we kind of know what that's going to look like. I think the question is more how Tanya Wu is going to try to try to make up the vote she didn't get or gain in the general, what that looks like, whether that means leaning into her, even you know more into her sort of community work in the CID, or if it means you know hammering on a particular issue like public safety or, or something like that. So I think that's I don't know. So, but that's what I would be looking for is where the sort of question lies. Um, but yeah, I think it's um, you know incumbents. Uh, don't get knocked off very often. I was trying to think, I probably should have just looked it up, but I, I was trying to think before this about when's the last time the Seattle City Council incumbent was unseated. And I was thinking about Gene Godden losing in the 2015 primary in a crowded race, but I think I could be totally spacing on a more recent one, but that seems like, in my mind, the the most recent one, and that's um, eight years ago now. So, go ahead, Melissa. Uh, I have a barking dog, so I'm trying to spare everyone from that. But yeah, I, now I think about it, I was thinking uh, time is flat to me at this point. But Richard Conlon was the year, a couple of years before that. So, what you're saying may be the very well the, the most recent. We haven't seen a lot of incumbents go down and have that those dramatic flips recently. It has happened, but not super recently. Um, I, I will say for Morales, I mean, since Sawant is leading the council, she is, I think, the most, in this traditional lens of going back to who's left and who's center, right? I, Morales is the for, sort of furthest left member I think we have up for election this year. So the fact that she did get, you know, pretty good results in the primary, it, 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 it suggests to me that there might not be this huge, huge, huge upswell of being fed up with far left city council politics. You know, I mean, there's certainly things people are unhappy with. We've seen polling that says, you know, pe people want more action on stuff, you know, housing, um, homelessness. People want action. They want things to ha to change, but they aren't necessarily voting out the most liberal um, candidates at this point. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's a really good point. And I think you know, I've talked about it before in other places, but sometimes we, we hear about polling a lot and it's, well, people are unhappy. And, and you know, that's a reflection on people being unhappy with, with city council members and approval ratings are low. And I think there are a lot of people who are unhappy with the state of things today. But I think sometimes we make assumptions about why that is and assume that, well, that automatically means that they're unhappy with their council member. And that's not necessarily the case. I think that this is yet another example of that where we need to go further and ask, okay, so you're not happy with the state of things. Is it because 
when it comes to public safety, do you want a more punitive and carceral approach or do you want more, you know, intervention and, and community violence intervention and, and more addressing root causes? And I think if you look at the people on the ground in Seattle, they, they do want to, to do more to address some of the systemic issues that we have, to address some of the root causes, get more to prevention instead of trying to respond to so much after the fact. And I think that that these results, almost in this race more than others, where there, there was kind of a direct contrast between the two and a direct policy difference between the two. And we saw voters basically affirm that the direction Tammy Morales is is heading is one that they're that most are are happy with and especially in a in a lower turnout primary election in an off year this is where you would expect unhappiness to really materialize if there was a desire to you know kind of kick all the bums out you know that that saying for for people who were elected but that that didn't seem to materialize with, with two of the three in, incumbents finishing over 50% um, and, and you know, the third with the plurality of the vote there. How do you think this, this uh, I guess, moves forward with that guy? Yeah, I do think it's a vindication for some of the people who were in the Solidarity Budget Coalition who were supporting decriminalization and defund that uh, maybe they see that like, um, one of the council members that stood by their side got over 50%. Um, I think they'll be reassured by that. Um, I do think Tanya Wu got a lot of support in the CID and was able to really voice um, to that neighborhood that has been kind of ignored a lot in the media by policymakers um, or used as tokens, um, but not actually given proper seat at the table. So I think um, even if Morales wins the general election, that'll be something that on top of, on the top of her priorities is to better address um, the CID. Um, and I think that was something that we was able to bring, even if she doesn't win in the general. Absolutely. Go ahead, Daniel. Oh, I was going to say, um, you know, and there's also sort of the differences district to district and candidate to candidate where, uh, you know, definitely uh, Tammy Morales had a <clears throat> looks like a strong result. On the other hand, you, you saw uh, I think Dan Strauss sort of trying to distance himself from some some of his defund pro defund advocacy from back in 2020. I think I saw a mailer, and so um, whether he's right or not, he's obviously a little bit concerned about some of that coming back to bite, bite him with voters in his district. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's some dis differences district to district as well. Yeah, I agree with that. Another district, District 3, uh, where uh, council member Shama Sawant will not be seeking re-election. So this is for the person who will succeed uh, council member Sawant. And so in this race, we have the two making it through, Joy Hollingsworth, with 36.89% right now, and Alex Hudson being the second making it through with 36.52. Another very crowded race. This is a very close result, maybe the closest result. And two very different candidates than the current incumbent. What do you think this says about the district and what do you think this says about the race? Starting with Melissa. Well, it is really close. You're less than a percentage point between these candidates now that we've seen the results shake out. And it is another situation where you have Joy Hollingsworth being the Seattle Times editorial board endorsed candidate, not the newsroom, but the editorial board. And um, Alex Hudson being the stranger endorsed candidate up against one another. However, it's interesting to me because, um, you know, Alex Hudson sort of is then would be in the camp of being this more progressive candidate. Right. Which I, which in certain ways she is. She's a tra longtime transit advocate uh, and is. You know, I remember one time, you know, her doing a video of confronting Tim Iman, the, you know, anti-tax initiative pusher. And so she's done that, those sorts of things. But she's also someone who's worked a little bit more within the establishment than certainly than Sawant, for instance, um, lobbying, sort of building coalitions. So we're not seeing and this has been said a lot about this race. And I'm not the only one to say it, but we're not seeing sort of anyone who wants to burn the barn down here in this race in the same way. We're not seeing a, so, a, a socialist candidate in the same way, even 
And I'm actually, I'm kind of, I haven't talked to these candidates as much as Dan and, and Guy probably have, but I actually think they're closer together on some issues than maybe it appears from those divergent endorsements. And I think some of that is likely to come to light during the um, general election. And it's possible that their positions don't as neatly line up um, necessarily with this sort of pro-business and labor slash um, le left, left activism, although in some ways they do. Do you agree, Guy? I definitely agree that it's a huge change from Shama Sawant and um, either one of the candidates won't be socialist. Um, and so I think that'll be something for Seattle left to kind of think about how do you um, build momentum for a more broad based long-term institutional victory, like to get five council seats at least instead of just one. Um, and that's, they have to go to the drawing board um, and think about that long-term. But um, in terms of Hudson and Hollingsworth, I think um, Hudson started off a little slow, but managed to snag some important endorsements. Um, and that's credit to her and her um, longtime presence in the policy world in um, Seattle. And I think Hollingsworth also is a very compelling candidate. I, I've seen her in so many different events in the community. She really shows up for like, for example, um, when Nurturing Roots was closing, in, back in March, um, she, not even in her district, but um, she was the only candidate to show up and show support. So I think that's credit to her and really cultivating her base in the CD. And um, I definitely think it'll be a tight race. Um, progressives did, all the progressive candidates together did win about four or 5% more than the more moderate candidates. So it'll be interesting to see if Hollingsworth can kind of uh, manage to build a coalition of moderate liberals um, and especially in the CD um, turnout folks who aren't voting um, just to get over the line. Do you agree, Daniel? Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess this is a, a race where Bruce Harrell has endorsed Joy Hollingsworth, right? So it'll be interesting to see what kind of impact that has, um, if any, that can be discerned. Um, Mayor Bruce Harrell, uh, yeah, Alex Hudson uh, has a very background, but coming out of the Transportation Choices Coalition, which is like, uh, you know, transit advocacy, but, you know, labor aligned and, you know, sort of in in the world of the big players in Seattle politics and been sort of a, like a, a policy and politician factory. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Rob Johnson, uh, council, council member, was the executive director there and um, Justin Farrell, former state uh, lawmaker and other people. So it's been, you know, sort of a, a turning out folks into, uh, into government. Uh, so that's interesting, but, you know, I think, uh, Melissa and Guy covered a lot of this, so I don't have a whole lot to add. I had, I had noticed just like on, um, social media a little bit, and I should say that I'm not, uh, my I should shout out my coworker, uh, Sarah Grace Taylor, who's been doing a lot of the coverage of the, the city council uh, races this year for us rather than myself. So I'm not the expert, but just on like observing on social media, I feel like I've seen a little bit of, you know, sort of different emphases in, in how the two candidates are, are positioning themselves. Joy Hollingsworth trying to emphasize her sort of community ties and um, Alex Hudson, uh, I just saw on the way over uh, to do this, talking up, uh, you know, transit as an issue, obviously because she's, that's some of her background, but also she must think it will play well with voters saying uh, in that district that's trying pretty transit reliant. Well, in, in theoretically, in theory, Joy Hollingsworth would be sort of the new candidate who's newer to politics in theory, if you look at them. However, Joy is coming from a family of sort of political legacies in a way as well. Um, her grandmother, Dorothy, was the first uh, African-American woman elected to the Seattle School Board. And I think that that's part of her community story a little bit that, that, that um, Joy is playing up. I mean, being from the Central District, being you know part of the legacy of people sort of make, making change and pushing forward, which is kind of interesting since she's sort of the more establishment candidate endorsed by the mayor. But it's kind of, that's why this, the dynamics of this race are a little interesting to me because um, 
the narrative is not as clean, I guess, is what we've kind of looked at um, races in the past where it's, again, lefty versus some, some more business friendly Democrat kind of races in Seattle. Yeah, I think that's that's spot on. And this is a district where there is a socialist as an incumbent. This is arguably the most left district in the city that doesn't quite have a candidate that that speaks to that far left um, end that that Shama Sawant does. And, and I do agree that there are potentially a number of overlaps or places where the policy differences may not be as clear um, from the very beginning. So I think this is going to be a race where it's going to be important to examine where the candidates stand. It's going to be important to understand where the differences are and to really understand what they're bringing in terms of not just votes, but where they're willing to lead and push perhaps the council. What are going to be their signature issues um, and, and what are going to be the issues where they may just be an additional vote? I think that there's a lot that people still don't know. And, and this is going to be one of the most interesting districts for trying to ferret out what those differences and contrasts are. Also notice that uh, fundraising in this race, again, a lot of money raised throughout the district. This is a race that we, we saw the uh, result being very close. Also the, the amount raised, both raising about $94,000 there and and so this is another race where you know both seem to have a lot of fundraising capacity is this going to be a race where outside entities get involved and i also think those outside entities are going to be listening for cues from each of those candidates who do funders see as their ally on the council who does labor see as a stronger ally on the council i think that there's still more that they're figuring out here and and those donations those types of donors and those endorsements are also going to do a lot of speaking for these candidates about where they stand and and how they're likely to govern i was surprised that based on just fundraising that alex cooley didn't do a little bit better because they raised you know ninety five thousand dollars as well i don't know if I, any of you can explain what happened there because i expected a better showing for that amount of money i thought i don't know just looking from the outside in yeah, I didn't um, follow it close Alex, enough to know. Was it mostly democracy vouchers? Um, yes, must be. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess that's was, my, it's a mystery to me. He was the only candidate to run on a platform of only taking democracy vouchers, and he uh -huh. didn't accept private donations, which I think is an interesting um, platform and could prove um, compelling if you think about, like, um, I'm not beholden to any interests, kind of only the people. Um but I think his ground game was strong, but he didn't have a lot of institutional support um, from like people like the stranger. And so that's why um, he kind of fell short. Yeah. And to pick up uh, on something that you mentioned when you introduced the race crystal, it is, it's kind of interesting to think about. So uh, Salant um, won her seat in 2013. So 10 years ago. And to think about how much District 3, those neighborhoods like Capitol Hill and, and the CD have changed in the last 10 years and think about, well, is that why we, you know, we didn't get uh, a, someone with Shama Sawant's politics in this race? Or is it because people are tired of her personally and that soured them, but but they, they voted her, you know, they voted narrowly, voted down a a uh, recall just recently so they're not that sick of it so so it's it's i don't know i find that interesting to sort of ponder on whether the fact that there are two very unlike salon candidates and two non-socialist candidates and in going into the general election has anything to do with her or not and has anything to do with changes in the electorate or not i don't have the answer but i'm kind of intrigued by that question I don't have the answer to that one either, but I do think this is a race where endorsements mattered a lot because it was hard just on the face to see some of the automatic differences between the candidates in a way that you can in, in some of the other districts, perhaps. And so this is another one where we talk about the importance of the times and the stranger endorsements, and that certainly carried through here. And people looking at the stranger as a cue to see who, you know, is considered to be the most progressive. Lots of times people are doing the same thing with the times on the other side. If they want a more 
moderate presence on the council. And so I think those endorsements really mattered in this race in particular, um, but in several of them overall. Also want to talk about the District 4 election. Now, this is a district where, um, you know, we talk about change over the last 10 years. This is certainly a district where I think recent results that we're seeing there reflect an evolution of the district and a change in this district. And so both um, with redistricting here and in this race, probably one of the cleanest lines between what is considered traditionally someone in the progressive lane and, and those traditionally in a, in a moderate to conservative lane. How did you see this race uh, shaping up, Guy? Yeah, I mean, um, I think it echoes the last um, 2019 elections, but now Ron P. Davis is um, number one instead of uh, Alex Peterson. So that's a good sign for him. And he is the strongest non-incumbent candidate in Seattle, um, winning 45% of the vote. Um, it does seem like with um, more development and just growing density, there are changing demographics. So it could be an opportunity for um, a pretty dramatic swing um, towards the left in this district. Um, but still like the more moderate um, conservative candidates won about 55% of the vote together. Um, if you add Wilson and um, the other, Wilson and Maritza Rivera, so um, it'll be very competitive. And I think it all relies on if um, Ron can turn out all the students to vote for him, um, who tend to lean more progressive. How do you see this race, Melissa? You know, it is theoretically, it would make sense to kind of add together those sort of more centrist candidates and say, oh, you know, they got 55. And I don't disagree with doing that guy. The thing that was weird to me is, um, and I, I wish I had in front of me at the moment, but there was a mailer that went out and Crystal, you saw this. And I just think Dan, you also probably saw this, but where it, it didn't, it seemed like um, Wilson was going after Rivera, who was closer to him politically than he was going after Davis and kind of like there were check marks. And it's like Davis got more checks being aligned with um, Wilson than Maritza Rivera did on this particular um, advertisement and mailer. And I don't know if that kind of communication is going to then make some people think that Davis is more aligned, the people who voted for Wilson, if they're gonna think, kind of go forward thinking Davis is more their guy than Rivera or if, you know, there's a lot of election communication still yet to happen. So I guess all of that can be reset. But it seemed like that was one of the primary communication that's happening in that district. And it kind of may have disrupted the dynamic in a way of um, the sort of candidates and saying, oh yeah, well, this is now my candidate since mine got knocked out since they're the most similar. And so I'm not sure how that will carry out forward going with this election into the general. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I Whether that mailer will sort of stick in anyone's mind and, and sour them on Rivera when they might not otherwise be. I mean, I think probably what Ken Wilson was going for there was just looking and assuming that, well, uh, Ron Davis is getting through. It's between me and uh, Maritza Rivera about who's getting through on the other lane. And so let's see if I can make that happen without, like we were talking about one of these newspaper endorsements. Um, and it didn't work uh, as much as he needed to, it to at least. Yeah, it's a, District 4 is interesting. Uh, Sean Scott and uh, ran, uh, uh, I think running as a democratic socialist to some extent in 2019 ran um, Alex Peterson really close in district four in that year. And I guess my sort of what I'll be watching for in this one is what, how Ron Davis moves forward, whether he tries to, you know, sort of draw a really sharp contrast between himself and Maritza Rivera. And he thinks that's the key, or if he tries to kind of, uh, uh, you know, sort of tack to the center a bit um, to try to win over some of those those um, maybe slightly more moderate voters or Ken Wilson voters in some way. And I'll just tell a there's a sort of funny story. I went out um, on election day to do some just person on the street voter reporting, and it was kind of funny because I was in sort of District Four, District Five for a while talking to voters, and I had two voters. One was a sort of like older boomer 
you know, sort of typical Seattle boomer voter. And to some extent, I guess, whatever that is. And they, um, you know, I said, what are you thinking about? And, and most of the people I talked to didn't have some sort of like mega narrative about the, the Seattle election cycle. Like, you know, this is, we're going to throw out of the, the lefties or we're going to, you know, do this. It was more, they're kind of grasping at straws a bit in my little unscientific sample size. But, but uh, this, this uh, somewhat older voter said, well, you know, I care about trees and I went to this tree protest in Wedgwood for like Luma, the cedar tree and uh, Ken Wilson was there and he seemed to care. So I'm voting for him. That's like a big reason. And then I talked to a voter, a sort of more lefty seeming voter in their, in her twenties, I think uh, elsewhere, I think in the U district. And, and they said, well, I, you know, I care about climate change. And I went to this protest for the cedar tree and Ron Davis was there. And uh, so I'm voting for him. So I don't know if that means anything, but it just goes to show. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, does Ron Davis lean into to the tree protest or does he lean into, you know, um, you know, let's densify and tax big business. Yeah, this, this is going to be interesting. And I, I those in, anecdotes are always so interesting. And I think underscores just from, from the inside a campaign candidate perspective, three quarters of the job, three quarters of the work is, is in showing up, whether it's on someone's doorstep, whether it's at an event. People want to see that you're actively engaged um, in the community and in the issues that they care about. So I would just encourage all of the candidates to do that. And the more you can talk to regular voters, the better. But but this is an interesting race here. This is another race where we also saw um, an independent expenditure on behalf of or in favor of uh, Maritza Rivera here. And, and it is, uh, you know, an interesting race where I don't know that this race these votes consolidate, you know, cleanly pre-mailer in, in, in the way that they would expect. Uh, on top of that, this is a district that, that you know, similar, a similar district just last year elected Daria Farvar. And, and you know, you think that the general um, election electorate is going to look more similar to, to what we saw in, in an even year election then. That certainly is more progressive than that district and that area has been for a while. So are we seeing a shift in the preferences of a district? Are we seeing a shift in the issues that are concerning people? Certainly housing affordability is a major issue throughout all of Seattle, but but also playing out in this district where I think the, the previous calculus and assumption was that this is a this is a district full of NIMBYs and, and they seem to be voting in the opposite direction now. So this is going to be a really interesting race to pay attention to and one that may attract a lot of outside money because there are clearer lanes with a moderate in the race seemingly and, and a progressive and, and looking to really pick up this seat for one of the other. Also want to talk about the district five race, which is another interesting, exciting race and, and was a pretty close race. So we have Kathy Moore here, a, a close overall, especially for the second and third place finisher here. So Kathy Moore finishing with 32.26% of the vote. Christiana Obey Summer, uh, they're finishing with 21.38% of the vote here. How did you see this, this vote shaping up in the primary? Nunu Jenks is finishing currently in third place, just outside of making it through the primary. Guy, how did you see this developing? Yeah, I think the District 5 race was by far the most fractured, and we had, um, I think, tied for the most amount of candidates. Um, and so people, I think a lot of people voted for um, their first choice, and um, I think Christiana was able to be a sort of dark horse and um, come out on top. Um, I think a lot of people were expecting Nilo Jenks to win, um, and so now those voters will have to decide whether they prefer more or um Christiana and I think that will decide which way the district goes but um I think North North Seattle um is not usually thought of as a progressive stronghold but it I think it is surprisingly pretty progressive um the in terms of 
where people are voting. Um, and I think people have all sorts of politics, like chaotic politics, where they support trees and density. And how do you reconcile those two? And I think that's up to the candidates to show that they're um, more well-spoken and have a stronger vision about um, integrating these various contradictions. What do you think, Melissa? You know, I, I was just reviewing some of the candidates sort of statements and where they're coming from. And it does sort of encapsulate um, to me a little bit. You you have Kathy Moore sort of talking about public safety. All of the candidates are talking about safety and should be coming to talk about public safety probably. Uh, but she's sort of coming at literally in her voter guide statement says, I'm the pragmatic solution, you know, very much very focused on sort of capturing that center lane, people who might want to see uh, a little bit more, uh, you know, timely police response is a huge part of her platform. And again, everyone wants the cops to probably, I think, to get word, get get respond to emergencies. Probably, I don't think there's too many people saying, "Well, okay, I, I I retract my statement." You know, it's a very complicated issue, actually. But but I mean, emphasizing that, you know, as opposed to emphasizing housing and sort of um, upstream solutions to homelessness, sort of which is where um, Christian where. Um, Christiana was sort of doing with her statements. I just think we have a lot of contrast between people talking about housing, to be honest, housing, housing, housing on one side, and then people kind of talking about public safety sometimes when you get in the more traditional races where you get those center lane candidates. And housing is kind of a message that's kind of resonating with people. I mean, people, I think, want housing to be a thing. And, and, and again, for instance, we had this social house, housing measure passed earlier this year. And uh, I think that kind of Tammy Morales, again, who, who, you know, is leading in that in her race and getting good, has really been supportive of that social housing measure and finding money to actually implement it. And as far as district back to district five, I think um, Christiana Obe, Obe Sumner is also kind of talking about those sorts of things more so than cops and hiring more police. And I think that there's people who want to hear them talk about that. And there certainly were other candidates in this race talking about um, sort of different solutions to some of the uh, sort of agreed upon crisis we see, maybe homelessness and housing. But I think those sort of holistic solutions, people are kind of listening to that, you know, talk in an interesting way in some of these races. And this is kind of an example of that to me. Yeah, th this is a race where I think there was a broader range of viewpoints represented in this race across the spectrum that we see in Seattle. Um, there was Ty Reed also in this race who was uh, very involved in the uh, social housing initiative and, and that passing um, and kind of taking up a left mantle, but a number of progressive candidates, I think, Yet again, this was another race where people were trying to figure out who was most aligned with their beliefs. Um, and, and that may have been not as easy as, as um, you know, some people would have thought at, at first glance. And so another race where I think the endorsements from the Times and the Stranger were once again consequential. But I also think this is, this is one where a lot of times I think we underestimate sometimes just individual candidate attributes, individual candidate performance, how people are connecting, and especially with how close this race was, particularly between the second and third place finishers, Christiana Obe Sumner and Nilu Jenks. You know, I think Christiana did a, did a more effective job at clearly articulating where they stood on issues. And that was more of a challenge for Nilu Jinx, where you know some people left with some impressions based on what they said, and and um, you know they said things that that gave other impressions to people, and so voters trying to reconcile who these candidates are and what kind of votes to expect, endorsing organizations, trying to ferret out you know what kind of votes should they expect from these. I, I think that this is an example of being clear about where you stand is helpful in, in getting through to, you know, establishment people, getting through to voters and, and making the kinds of connections that get you through to the general election. What do you think, Daniel? Well, I was going to say, yeah, I don't have a lot to add. I don't think about these particular two candidates, um, but uh, I, 
Well, I spent some time on election day, again, my very unscientific sample size by the Lake City Library. And a lot of people were talking about homelessness. People were talking about public drug use. And it'll be interesting to see how these candidates uh, navigate some some issues like that. I do think that, you know, the uh, questions about prosecuting uh, people for using drugs in public, you know, that has been in the headlines recently at City Hall. So that will likely in this race and others be something that it's talked about. Um, uh, but, but Guy mentioned uh, Daria Farivar's, uh, or maybe you did, Crystal, or both of you, uh, that election that she ran and won last year. And I, I would think that candidates in both District 4 and District 5 might want to be looking at that and like, well, what did, you know, some of it's just about a candidate and their personality and their what they got have going for them. But, but, you know, if you're a smart candidate in those districts, you're looking at that race and like, what did she do? And, and also just reminded me that in terms of sort of some changes politically is that on issues like, um, you know, uh, criminal justice or, or the legal system on issues around housing, both zoning, which is traditionally very much a city issue uh, but also on sort of funding affordable housing. There are more of those, it seems like there are more of those conversations and more action happening in Olympia than there was some years ago. And I don't know if that sort of makes some of these city races feel a little bit less urgent for folks, but it's something that's occurred to me where, you know, uh, some years ago when there was just nothing happening in the state legislature, when people are looking for help or for change, um, it made city elections that much more high stakes, but maybe that's been changing a little bit. Yeah, and, and I also think this is an interesting race um, just because of the expanded representation that could potentially be coming to the council. Um, Non-binary person, disabled BIPOC um, person, and, and that kind of representation being really important. We're seeing so many other members of the community deal with challenges um, and, and access issues related to that, that some lived experience could be very enlightening and helpful in crafting solutions that meet the needs of everyone in the city. So I'll be interested to see um, that explored throughout the general election and just figuring out, once again, where these candidates stand on issues. There's going to be a lot that, that the city council is going to be dealing with over the next several years. And so I hope that that there really is an attempt to figure out where the candidates stand and, and what solutions they feel, you know, not just that they're willing to vote for, but that they're really willing to lead on and try and craft solutions with their colleagues on, on this, with, on this um, for. So also want to talk about uh, the next district here, a race with an incumbent here, Dan Strauss and Pete Hanning, one where there was quite a bit of money in this race um, quite a bit of spending, and uh, uh, you know, Dan Strauss. This was really interesting because, uh, as we touched on before, um, you know, we saw with Tammy Morales really leaning into her record and, and a seeming justification and and you know approval of, of that and almost a mandate from from voters to continue on in the same direction, based on how she represented herself different strategy here and, and someone looking like they're running away from their record a bit or saying, Hey, I, I'm course correcting here. So do people know what they're getting? Do people know what they're expecting, but still a strong result for an incumbent here with Dan Strauss currently at 51.77% of the vote in uh, district six. And then Pete Hanning, who was the Seattle times Endorsed candidate with 29.32% of the vote, um, despite almost, uh, you know, over $96,000 raised. How did you see this race, Melissa? Uh, you know, I think Dan, Dan has probably looked at this a little more closely, but I did find it interesting um, that Dan Strauss, um, getting back to Dan Beekman's point earlier, was Dan Strauss was just saying uh, defund the police was a mistake. Like he just, that's, he said it straight up. That's just, he, he was emphasizing that. And I, I, that, that has to be a reflection of his district. Um, and I, gosh, I should be more familiar with the new district lines, but we are talking about a different district than, you know, uh, district three, which is central Seattle here. We're talking about, you know, oh gosh, I mean, I actually miss, mix up the, uh, 
two guys on the council, not infrequently, is super embarrassing. But anyway, so Dan Strauss's district, though, is very different than central Seattle. It's not Andrew Lewis's district, which is different, but we're talking, you know, um, an area that does have more conser conservative pockets. Conservative is it gets in Seattle and away. Um, so, um, so the defund the police, he's saying was a mistake, but then other people, um, that message hasn't resonated in some of the other races. So we are talking about a district that is very um, unique, I think, from some of the central Seattle districts um, in that uh, apparently Dan's doing really well, just, you know, completely acting like defund the police was like a discussion that never should have happened. So it uh, will be interesting seeing what happens there. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think um, Dan Strauss is definitely benefiting from being an incumbent to the to the extent that people, they may not feel like they love the guy, although some, you know, some voters I'm sure do, but, but they know who he is. They know his name. He's been in office. His, his kind of like, um, you know, he, he, gives off or tries to give off a sort of, you know, I'm just Dan from Ballard vibe, you know, your local guy, uh, who, you know, a nice guy. And maybe that probably puts off some people, but, but I think he benefits, uh, from that in, and people just looking at the ballot and they may not, they may know the red door, but they may not know Pete Hanning's name. So, um, I mean, the one thing that I thought I was looking at that I was sort of most interested in was this is the district that changed most dramatically in redistricting. So it used to be sort of the west part of north of the cut, you know, Ballard going up uh, all the way up to uh, uh, Blue Ridge, et cetera, Broadview, and then over... Um, uh, sort of towards towards Green Lake, but now it hops the cut and basically is like Ballard, Fremont, and Magnolia, and you know, looking at sort of the maps, all that's been released map wise in terms of precinct level results is election night, so it's not the full picture, but you get a sense for the pattern. And overall, the map I don't think looks looks any different from any other Seattle election map, but this is a new configuration for that district. And so interesting to see, you know, uh, Dan Strauss did very well in sort of central Ballard, the, the sort of more apartment heavy part of Ballard in Fremont uh, and that Pete Hanning's stronghold to the extent he had one, the primary was in Magnolia, um, which isn't necessarily surprising, uh, but, uh, but it's just, it's a new map. So it's fun to see a new map. <laughs> It is fun to see a new map. Uh, how did you see this guy? Yeah, I mean, Dan Strauss had a very impressive personal mandate. I think he got the most votes by far out of any of the Seattle City Council races. And this was like the only district that reached like 40% turnout. Um, so I wonder if that's um, in part because of um, just the demographics being wealthier, whiter, more middle class. Um, but I do wonder how much of that mandate is just because he's kind of the default milk toast moderate um, white guy, um, or if it's just um, like people are passionate about him. Um, and, or I think a lot of people read The Stranger um, and kind of voted for him. That would be my guess. And also he's incumbent and he's kind of somehow managed to spin himself as not being that inoffensive um and also i'm curious about pete hanning like um if his qu candidate quality was as high as some of the other candidates um in terms of getting his name recognition out there and like actually making a mark um and so that would be his challenge but going into the general election but i would be very very shocked if strauss doesn't win at this point <laughs> Yeah, it, it would be unprecedented for someone in, in Strauss's position or, or really someone in Morales' position not to be successful in the general. The power of incumbency is real. Um, it is really, really hard to take out an incumbent, which is why sometimes you hear with a number of challengers excitement that it kind of takes the electorate being in a place where they're ready to make a change and signaling they're going to make a change and then takes a candidate who can take advantage of that. It looks like some were banking on 
the electorate being in more of a mood for a change than they actually are, which I think changes perhaps some of the strategy that some of the challengers had going in. Um, but I think this is a case where, you know, there's an incumbent and people may have their feelings. I, I think he does try to be generally inoffensive. Um, and it's and it's hard for a lot of the district to really, you know, to very strongly, passionately dislike him. But even those who were open to a change, I think one thing, it, it's one thing to say, OK, I, I'm willing to hear other points of view, but it does take a candidate who can really articulate a clear vision and connect with voters to give them something that they can say, OK, I can say yes to this. There is another vision here that I'm aligned with. And I don't know that voters heard another vision that they're necessarily aligned with unless they were really unhappy in the first place. It just looks like the amount of people who were really unhappy um, with with their own council member just is, is not that big of a number, not one that's, that's automatically creating a shift on the council. And so I, I think the job of a number of these challengers is a little bit harder than than they bargained for. And I think um, here in another race, a closer race with an incumbent in District 7, Andrew Lewis finished with, or currently has as of you know today, the 8th, 43.47% of the vote to Bob Kettle's 31.5. How do you see this race shaping up, Guy? Yeah, um, I thought this was really a little surprising to me um, that Lewis did so poorly here. Um, he still got the plurality, but he didn't have any challenges from the left. So it was a lot of pretty right wing candidates um, or center um, who were really attacking him for his drug ordinance vote, um, policing. Um, and I think this is probably the place we can expect uh, Chamber of Commerce or their successor organizations to um, pouring a ton of money to unseat him, um, to unseat Lewis. Um, we also saw very low turnout, um, in part because I think um, places like South Lake Union um, have a lot of expats and a lot of folks um, who are from around the country who don't pay attention to local politics. And so it might be important to have a ground game and activate those voters. And um, for Lewis, just to find new voters instead of... Um, trying to um, look weak and flip-flop on issues. Um, but that's just my two cents. I, uh, Go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, I, I was just thinking the guy was making some good points there. And, you know, in theory, uh, the turnout should grow from the primary to the general election just as a rule. Uh, so, yeah, Andrew Lewis is going to need to go after more voters. And in his uh, 2019 race, he had the advantage of um, not just, I think, ad spending outside, but he had, I remember, because I went out with them, uh, uh, hotel workers, union hotel workers, d knocking doors, turning out the vote for him on their own through independent you know, work. Um, from his campaign, uh, independent from his campaign in that election, and certainly he would he would hope to get that kind of support you know, to turn out those additional voters um, in the general, or else um, maybe he's in trouble. But uh, yeah, and it, it, you know, I always like to look at the map. Uh, you know, it was interesting looking at this one too, where you just had some some real clear like top of Queen Anne anti and, and downtown to some extent anti Andrew Lewis voting um, or pro his, his challengers. And then the rest of the district, I think he, he did fairly well, but um, if turnout is, is a lot higher on upper Queen Anne, the lower Queen Anne, it doesn't matter sort of what the map looks like <laughs> um, in terms of, in terms of space on it. Is that how you size it up, Melissa? Yeah, I mean, I just think Andrew Lewis has a lot of work to do um, going uh, forward to the general because theoretically uh, you expect, I, I think it's a reasonable to expect voters who voted for, for instance, like Olga Sagan, the um, restaurant owner who is very anti 
the work of the city council and anti Andrew Lewis's record, they're more likely those voters were, are likely to vote for Bob Kettle, I would think, in this particular case, than, you know, suddenly say, well, maybe he's OK now. Um, so, I mean, and that would get that would get, you know, that alone. She only got 12 percent or something like that. But that that's a sizable chunk to add to Bob Kettle's um, total there. And, uh, you know, I do notice that Andrew Lewis seems a little worried. I do think he's trying to, you know, make sure his name's out there for stuff he's doing on the council right now, which all of them are doing who are incumbents. But uh, I feel like Lewis especially is aware that he has some ground to make up. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think that that Lewis has some reassuring to do of, of a lot of his base. I think that um, right or wrong, but I, I think that there's cause for it, that there are people wondering if he really is a champion on their issues or can be pressured to, to not vote a certain way. I think um, more than other, uh, I, certainly for the incumbents that are there, I think he's viewed as more of a swing vote than some others, which, which really says you, you may not know exactly what you're getting from him if you're in his base. And I think that's a challenge. I, I think that, that candidates, certainly incumbents are in a stronger position if they do have you know a, a well-defined um, persona, defined stances, that, that at least your base knows what they're gonna get. And then you try and, and expand that a little bit. I think he has, has more of a challenge than the other incumbents there. With that said, I think that, that he is probably in a stronger position to win the general election. Um, not that this won't be competitive, certainly, but, sure. but I think if you're looking between the two of them, and, and you're a betting person, you know, he's more likely to be able to consolidate the vote and pick up um, people who vote in the general, who don't mm. necessarily vote in, in the primary, than a more moderate candidate. But I think this is a race that's that has a lot of attention and mm. a lot of interest and, and one where we're likely to see outside spending playing a significant role in this yeah. race. Yeah, and you are right that he didn't just annoy sort of centrist, you know, people who want to see more prosecution of drug arrests. He actually has annoyed the progressives at various times by sort of flip-flopping. I'm thinking about the capping rent fees as a one vote he had where, you know, at first he was going, he was uh, supporting a higher cap fee on, um, a, a higher maximum fee on sort of late rent than maybe the progressives wanted and then kind of went back to supporting a lower one. It was like $10 versus 50 or something like that. You know, but he was kind of not... Um, I think he, that that some of the progressives were like, hey, where is this guy at on this with that when they wanted to see that that cap on late rent fees? I feel like it's hard to me for me to say all those words together correctly, but um, we wanted to see a very, very tight cap on how much landlords could charge for late rent. And Lewis was kind of a little more willing at one point to consider, you know, letting landlords charge a little more for that. And that was something that disappointed progressives, too. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's like, are you threading? You know, he may be trying to thread the needle on some of these issues, but if he if he can't thread it correctly, does it look like you're, or are you flip flopping, or or being, are you wavering, rather than threading? <laughs> it does seem like um, Lewis has um, been a little less successful with that strategy than Strauss, um, and maybe that's also because of their districts. But um, I think he should be worried a little bit about alienating those people who would maybe support him otherwise um, for like stranger readers or that um, like labor, for example, our labor union is actually going to come out and bat for him at this point um, like they did in 2019. So um, that will be uh, um, something he has to work on in the next couple months. Yeah, it is. And so we've covered all of these uh, Seattle City Council district races, looking at them, you know, is there a narrative to all of these races b before this? Um, Mayor Bruce Harrell had talked about recruiting against some of the incumbents here, having some candidates here. Do you see this as um, an acceptance, a repudiation? Uh, Jury still out on on what this says about where people stand in alignment with the mayor based on these results. Guy? Um, I think, firstly, all the races are very competitive. Um, so that was 
um, a little different than expectations. I think progressives do have a shot of actually um, kind of winning back control a little bit or retaining control, um, depending on how you define that. But I think the biggest narrative for me is just how low turnout we had. We had like only like 15% of 18 to 24 year olds vote across King County. So um, that shows that the political process isn't engaging a big amount of people, um, which is probably the most concerning fact out of this primary. What do you think, Daniel? Uh, well, I don't know. In terms of sort of like big takeaways overall, you know, I guess we wait and see for the general. Um, you know, some of there's some like sort of fundamentals in Seattle politics that aren't going to change that much generally from like year to year. And like a lot of that is present in this election, especially when, you know, as Guy was saying, the turnout wasn't high. There didn't seem to be tons of energy, <laughs> you know, even relative to other city elections for this primary. And like I was mentioned before, that might not change unless there's one of these sort of big narratives that sort of and they can be unpredictable like that amazon money bomb or like you know who knows maybe there's going to be another one of these tree protests you know that really sort of like you know galvanize the voter imagination at the right moment and or or, or something around drugs and and sort of make it you know sort of uh, a pull pull an election out of sort of the normal <laughs> sort of rut of, of where you have these two general political factions and electorates in the city that are f fairly evenly balanced. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if there's something like that, that that grabs people and makes this time different in some way. What are your thoughts, Melissa? Well, well, I think there's a lot of potential for change on the council. That's mostly, to me, the function of there being four open seats. And then, uh, you know, actually, we'll get probably get to this in our last moments, but probably there'll be five seats that change over on the council, it looks like, which is five out of nine. That's a majority. So there's a lot of potential for change. However, it doesn't strike me that the incumbents are in danger of losing, necessarily. So... The change is just from new people coming in, but not throwing the old people out is what it looks like. Lewis might be the one exception. He's the closest to you know potentially losing his seat, but um, I'm not certain that will happen either. So we could just end up with a lot of new voices and a lot of the incumbents all staying, um, which um, the new voices may be aligned with the mayor. It's hard to say. I was just kind of doing like napkin math and like looking at vote counts and how it would kind of work out. But to that point, though, we don't know how some of these folks yet would vote on certain issues. So it's kind of even hard to do that. It's it's. Um, you know, do I know where George Hollingsworth stands on certain every single, you know, vote that the council's had on housing policy and, you know, uh, tax, taxing in the past five years? I, you know, I actually don't. So I don't know how those votes would shake out, even if, you know, which, whichever faction is election, elected. But I do think the progressive candidates, you know, are doing well um, in, in a lot of these races. Um, so that'll be interesting to see. It might just be that the biggest change in dynamic is something that well has nothing to do with November, and it's that no more salon on the council. I mean, uh, not that she always gets what she wants. That's hardly the case, but that's just been such a you know a constant uh, uh, dynamic in, at City Hall for the last ten years, and so um, you know that could sort of just change the way things are done and and the sort of the whole political landscape uh, up there on the dais at city council as much as you know some of these seats other seats swapping out in, or who gets in the in those seats yeah i uh tend to agree with that and i think once again i hope people whether you're an organization who's going to be doing forms or examining that or or voters as you have opportunities to have conversations with these candidates that you ask them where they stand and you hold them accountable for for stating their position for stating how they would have voted for talking about how they they did vote when they voted on different things so that you know what you're getting in terms of of a council member and their vote um, I, I think that there's growing frustration around looking at some of 
these challenges that that we're facing in the city of Seattle and around the region, whether it's um, homelessness or public safety or um, climate change or, you know, taxation or progressive revenue, that there's been a lot of rhetoric over the past several years, but maybe not the kind of change that people would expect based on some of the broad rhetoric that people have heard. And so I, I think the lesson to take from that is to really drill down and, and, you know, not just have people give you their very rosy, I believe the children are the future type, type sayings, but you know, when, when they can't get everybody to agree, when everyone, you know, gathered around the table, doesn't come up with one solution, what are they willing to step up and advocate for? What are they willing to stand up and say, okay, I know this may not make everyone happy, but this is what I believe we need to do and how we need to move forward. I think those will be the most enlightening conversations um, that come out of this general election and, and will be the most helpful for voters making decisions. I do want to talk about these King County Council races. And one of these races features a current Seattle City Council member, Teresa Mosqueda, in the District 8 race against current Burien mayor, Sophia Aragon. This um, had a very strong showing, uh, again, for Seattle City Council incumbent, Teresa Mosqueda, with 57.56% of the vote right now. Sophia Aragon, 37.57%. Uh, you know, I don't think it's controversial to say that this is, you know, extremely likely to result in Teresa Mosqueda, winning, um, you know, this race in the general election, I'll, you know, we still have to go through it. Nothing is, is absolutely set in stone, but this is about as safe as you can look as an incumbent. And interestingly enough, another Seattle City Council member who has been on the forefront of, um, you know, big progressive policy wins, probably at the top of the list, the jumpstart tax, which has been very consequential for the city of Seattle. What was your take um, of this of this race, and and what do you think the big issues were, or what this says about voters here in this race? I guess starting with Guy. I think the first um, outcome I think is just it shows how important high quality candidates are. Um, I think Teresa is exemplary, um, qualified. I think she has a, a lot of connections with local labor organizations, visit, um, local community groups. And so she was really able to outmatch um, Sophia Aragon in that. Um, and it also showed that I think that district was looking for more than just platitudes about policing and homelessness. And the third thing is maybe it's also a backlash against Aragon's handling of um, the recent saga over homelessness in Burien and just um, how much the um, city has intensified sort of vitriol against its unhoused population under her majority control. So um, those were my three takeaways. Absolutely. And, and for those unfamiliar, they're, they're you know, a, a dramatic saga currently playing out still in the city of Burien, where there um, have been a number of sweeps that have taken place with um, some homeless encampments there in the city. Um, those sweeps have to operate in a constitutionally um, legal framework. It looks like the city of Burien got outside of that framework. They were warned by the King County executive that they were outside of that. You can't sweep people without an offer of shelter. But sometimes in cities, a major issue is that they don't have the resources to do that uniquely in Burien. King County offered to provide shelter and, and you know, a number of pallets, a million dollars worth of that, basically, hey, work alongside us and, and we'll, you know, help you work through this with your population. And, you know, from the, the mayor, the deputy mayor on down basically rejected that offer and would rather, uh, you know, not take that up, not house the population and, and kind of double down on more punitive, criminalized um, uh, efforts which it seems may not be very popular in the city and whether people like, you know, favor more punitive or more um, evidence-based solutions there, it seems like the one thing people do want is action taken. And when it looks like that isn't being taken, that's a challenge that may have been a factor here in this race. I'm wondering what kind of, of 
addition to the council or, or what does it look like voters voted for in terms of policy here and in terms of, um, you know, potential budget impacts or taxation? How did you see this, Melissa? I mean, like, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Mosqueda was really active in getting a tax on big business. This was the Amazon tax was that actually ended up passing, you know, after uh, the heads tax kind of was an effort that failed in 2018. Mosqueda kind of picked up the pieces uh, and there were others, too. But she kind of led this effort to actually get a tax on business passed in Seattle, which I think is a pretty big achievement, given how spectacularly that effort fell apart previously. Um, and so she's sometimes been vilified by the Salons, for instance, as being like too, too willing to work with people or something. But if you get if you do get the ta- an Amazon tax, you know, out of it, then I, that seems to please progressives for the most part. So I think you will get some progressive views on tax policy on the county council if if Mosqueda is elected, which she is likely to be. It looks like, and you know, Mosqueda is interesting because she is not. She she has not, I don't not, don't think, walked away from the idea of saying, I don't, you know, the number of police is not necessarily equivalent to having great public safety. I don't think we need all these police. She hasn't really walked back from her statements on that so much as maybe Dan Strauss and others here. And this was a real interesting contrast because that's exactly where Aragon was going after her, um, saying, you know, defund the police has failed. Has the city council of Seattle actually, did they actually follow through with actually defunding stuff? Not, not quite exactly, but the, you know, the, the, there were, the discussion certainly happened. And that was a side that Mosqueda was interested in looking at other solutions as opposed to hiring more cops for sure. That's certainly fair to say. So, I mean, the voters in that area seem to think that's fine. I mean, these 20 point spread here, it's not close. So, um, I think that the thing that interests me most, I, I think the county council is interesting and then Mosqueda will join that and it will create another progressive voice in the county council. But then we're going to have a fifth city council seat that needs to be filled. And that will happen by appointment. Um, and that that's a wild card. Voters aren't really going to be involved in that. Um, and I mean, again, getting ahead of myself, the election has not happened, but 20 point spread. Like we can probably assume there, there's going to be a fifth vacant uh, opening on the city council. So so that's the fifth seat that we aren't even really talking about on the ballot, which then um, there'll be people who parade through the city council, you know, um, you know, presenting themselves for the job. And they will have that happen probably toward the end of this year after the elections are over or maybe early January, depending on the timing. But that will mean a majority of the city council is changing over. And um, it could it could be a, not, not a progressive person re- re- replacing Mosqueda on the city council. I mean, they won't be super far right or anything, but you know, you could get a more centrist person than she is in that role because voters don't really have a say in it. Yeah. And certainly whoever winds up on the council is going to be very consequential in that decision. What are your thoughts, Dan? Oh, I was just uh, looking at the, um, the election night uh, results map and I should plug uh Washington Community Alliance because they did this and then put it out there. So that's what I'm looking at. But um but the interesting thing, like I think it might be a little bit tempting because Sophia Aragon is um uh is elected official. Is she the mayor right now of Burian or yeah, she's a mayor of Burian. Yep. So it might be a little tempting to sort of read views into the whole Burian Bruja uh in this result and maybe there's some of that but looking at the map you know Miriam is actually relatively speaking she did decently yeah and the district also includes like the dense part of capitol hill and the dense part of west seattle and that's where Mosqueda cleaned up so i think um i think you could a little bit more look at this and say uh you know it's a it's um the opposite of a repudiation in terms of Mosqueda's work on the city council, but I'm a, I would be a little bit more hesitant to read into it all that much about Burian, um, even though maybe some of that could go on. Yeah, I think this is, um, that's an interesting point. And, and again, I think that the mapping, more mapping options is wonderful. Kind of similar with first night results. I caution people against looking at first night precinct results. Those um, tell a different story in the same way that the numbers tell a different story. So I'm super eager to dive into these when we have 
um, yeah. full results on on those and and um, looking at that uh, seems to be more enlightening and, and more accurate as to where things wind up there. But but a really interesting view. And then in the other competitive um, King County Council race, District 4, where there were three pretty progressive candidates actually in this race in the primary where there was um, Jorge Barone, Sarah Reineveld, and then Becca Johnson Poppy. All, you know, looking at this in comparison to the city council races, the other county council race, this is a race where all three of these candidates were, you know, I think it's probably fair to, to say most people would consider them all to be progressives. And, and you know, I, I moderated one, one or two forums for this in, in the primary election. And, and these answers were routinely to the left of several of the city council members here. But it looks like, you know, in this race, a, a, an interesting dynamic, Jorge Barone, um, got in the race a little bit later. He was previously involved in, in the legislative session and so had to finish that, that up before joining the race, but ended up securing the endorsements of both the Times and The Stranger, which most people don't generally do. Uh, usually there are only, you know, select few candidates each cycle who wind up getting both of those endorsements. He did, and it definitely shows and the results with Jorge, you know, usually you don't see someone in an open seat primary getting over 50%. Jorge Barone is currently at 50.65%. Sarah Reineveld um, also advancing through to the general election at 28.7% here. How do you think this race um, shaped up and, and what did you see from this race, uh, Melissa? I mean, Jorge is just such a, it has a big, big lead, as you said, and getting, I mean, again, this is not an incumbent getting 51, almost 51% of the vote. This is a new candidate, but I did, do think this speaks to Jorge having done a lot of work. I mean, I, when we go back to 2017 and people um, rushing to SeaTac Airport to um, respond to President, then President Trump's ban on travel from certain Muslim countries. Jorge Barone was at the forefront of a lot of work. With, he was at the Northwest Immigrants Rights Project, I, I, I believe. If I'm off the top of my head, I, I think of it as the acronym, so I hope I have the full name correct here. Uh, but he's done so much work there where he's been sort of um, gotten a lot of earned media coverage because of doing a lot of work on behalf of people in the community. I think that that, uh, separate, even if he hadn't campaigned at all, which I know he didn't just sit on the sidelines, but that did a lot of work before he even started campaigning. And I think that's reflected in the numbers here. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and to people looking to learn lessons when you're running, this is, this is an excellent example of someone building their profile through serving in the community and people being aware of of the work that they're doing, seeing tangible ways that that is playing out in the community. I think Jorge certainly benefited um, from that and, and benefited from, from just people saying, I, I, I certainly was a supporter of, of the work at the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project and, you know, so impactful and important in the community. How did you see this guy? Yeah, I think, um, it really shows um, Jorge Barón's um, ground game kind of making, or rather the opposite of ground game, kind of the networking and just um, having served in the community for so long, I think um, was probably what got him that endorsement and familiarity with um, policy issues for years. Um, yeah, and I think it's a bit of a unicorn endorsement. I'm very curious what the deliberation was between the Seattle Times and the Stranger editorial boards. Um, and it does kind of show just how much power they have as gatekeepers, particularly in more low turnout elections like these August primaries. How did you see this, Daniel? Oh, I don't have that much to add. I think Melissa and Guy, you know, nailed it. Um, only one anecdote is that uh, it, the stranger Seattle Times double endorsement is like kind of a unicorn, should be a slam dunk. But actually, uh, John Grant in 2017 had both and <laughs> got defeated, I think, pretty handily by Teresa Mosqueda, who we were just talking about. So it's not an absolute slam dunk always, but in this case, it looks like it probably will be. 
Uh, definite themes of Teresa Mosqueda as a powerhouse in a number of different ways, it seems like. Now, as we, you know, we've talked about, about a number of these races and we're almost done with time. So I guess just going around the horn here, what are you paying attention to most? What do you think is going to be the most interesting or impactful thing in the general election um, either as a theme for these races or in any particular race um, that you're following, starting with Melissa. Oh, geez. Okay. Yeah. Well, I am really interested to know what people think about tax policy and whether they're supportive of new taxes that go beyond the jumpstart tax um, to, because the city does have a budget deficit, not right at this precise moment over the next six months, but pretty big projected budget deficit going toward 2025. And I'm curious how candidates will, respond with specifics about how they what they'd support to deal with that uh and then i'm also interested in what candidates where the candidates are on these police issues because it's kind of like again when you talk about slogans like defund the police that isn't even exactly what happened in seattle so it's like what are we talking about and so that's kind of what i'm watching is where um what candidates actually have to say about that and what they mean when they say i don't like defund the police or what does this mean? So I, I, I'm just really, now that there's not 10 candidates in a race, looking forward to actually figuring out where people stand on issues, hopefully. hopefully. And Guy? Yeah, I think um, I'm looking forward to see um, if the economy rebounds a bit and if people start um, feeling a little less burnt out from politics. Um, and whether candidates and their ground game can really go upstream and try to convince convince some of the disillusioned young folks and especially more of the progressive folks who are not as happy with Biden um, and are not looking forward to voting um, and just convince them that voting matters and that they're not throwing away their time by filling out the ballot. And what about you, Daniel? Uh, I guess in Seattle City Council races, I'm just curious to see. I mean, I think the the sort of more the conservative moderate candidates, you know, um, maybe unfair to paint with a broad brush, but like th that sort of side of things will probably, whether there are you know policy solutions, they're realistic to go along with these, but they'll kind of you know bang on, you know, uh, oh we need to crack down or get you know tough uh, with. Um, with crime and drugs and that kind of thing. Uh, I'm interested to see though, what the left, left lane candidates um, try to use as sort of wave as the banner policy wise. Is it raising taxes on businesses more? Is it, you know, the rent control? Is it, um, uh, you know, another minimum wage, you know, a hike or like, what is it, you know, can they find something to latch on to that's going to capture the voters imagination and then i'm also just curious about some of these suburban um suburban uh races like i was talking about before we went live about uh, bothell and burian and some interesting stuff up there like you know bothell has this sort of growing urbanist political streak and will that continue with one of the races up there looks like it, it could and and can more sort of try finding itself dealing with affordable housing issues more and maybe uh, getting a little bit of a lefty push and will that continue so I'm going to keep my eye on those. What I'm most looking forward to is to see where donors settle in these races. There's um, certainly donors were spread out amongst a variety of candidates in the primary, but in some of these races, it's not super clear at the moment um, where the candidate stances are on all the issues. Is there, you know, some races, it's, it's pretty clear to say that there's a progressive and a moderate. Others, it's kind of to be determined and the details of that are yet to be determined. So it's going to see, it's going to be interesting to see where donors consolidate, who more corporate type donors feel is is uh, are the candidates that are going to be on their side where they invest usually they do not donate um to places where they don't feel pretty sure they're going to get a return on that investment of the candidates so that's going to be interesting to see and i will be paying attention to that throughout the primary certainly 
And with that, uh, thank you for listening to this roundtable as it now comes to a close. I want to thank our panelists, Daniel Beekman, Guy Aron, and Melissa Santos for their insight and in making this an engaging and informative event. To those watching online, thanks so much for tuning in. If you missed any of the discussion tonight, you can catch up on the Hawks and <laughs> you can catch up on the Hacks and Wonks Facebook page, YouTube channel, or on Twitter where we're at Hacks Wonks. Special thanks to essential member of the Hacks and Wonks team and coordinator for this evening, Dr. Shannon Chang. If you missed voting in the election or know anyone who did, make sure to register to vote, update your registration, or find information for the next election at myvote.wa.gov. And as a reminder, even if you've been previously incarcerated, your right to vote is restored and you can re-register to vote immediately upon your release in Washington state, even if you are still under community supervision. Be sure to tune into Hacks and Wonks on your favorite podcast app for our Tuesday topical interviews and our Friday weekend review shows or at officialhacksandwonks.com. I've been your host, Crystal Fincher, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>